All right, well, before we get going, we've got, had a question from Max. Um, he's asked where the water fleas or Daphne have come from in his pond. Um, now, there's a few possible routes. One, they could have come in on some plants you put in there or snuck in with some other animals because they are quite small. But they also have uh, these, these tiny, apps, you know, microscopic uh, uh, waterproof egg cocoons that can survive being dried out. Um, and they will stick to um, birds' feet and stuff like that. But there's even a paper of one sticking to the back of a back swimmer or water boatman. Um, so, yeah, they, they could come in stuck, the eggs can come in stuck to even insects. Because, of course, they can fly from pond to pond as well, a lot of these insects. So, yeah. The video's coming through. It's, it's showing a bit jerk on my laptop, but I think that's because my laptop's struggling a bit. Right, it's showing two minutes past for me, so I'm going to make a start. Um, and let's. Uh, so, so, what I've got set up, I've got a. Um, I won't move my laptop and show you all guys. If, if you want to see what how I've set everything up, pop onto Instagram afterwards because I've got a little sort of warning that I'm going to be online. And you can have a quick little bit of sneak preview. Basically, I've got a load of tanks set up. I've got some creatures and some pots ready to go in the tanks. Um, and I've got my camera, my um, microphone Fred camera, uh, tethered to the laptop. So it's connected by USB cable, basically. Um, and that should let us see these things quite nice and close up. Um, now, you might hear some banging when I'm talking. And that's the wires catching. Because I have to wear two two coats. Because it's so blooming cold in this shed at the moment. Um, should have thought that bit through. Right, so I'm just going to set up the first creature, and then well, I think what we'll do is if we'll switch to the window, so bear with me a second. Here we go. Right, so you're now looking at what my camera can see, and there is already a creature in this tank. I just need to. Here we go. And what I'll do is I'll get him into the. Try to get him to sit somewhere where we can actually see him. And he's going to strangle leaf again. So there's going to be a fair bit of. Um, of course, he was sat perfectly for about half an hour before he came on. And he, just before I went to broadcast, he decided to move. Here we go. That's it. Stay there. There's a good source of that. Here we go. Right, no, he's moving still. <laughs> I do warn you, the animals might not behave. Here we go. He's sat still briefly, so we're going to. In on him. Here we go. Oh, there's a water beetle in there as well. I didn't put that in there, must have come in on the leaf. So we've got a Barosis uh, crawling water beetle swimming around. That's a small thing, but this big thing we're, we're looking at is a saucer bug. So the one swimming around it, I'll just have a quick look at this beetle while we're here. So this chap is what's known as a crawling, in co common terms, is a crawling water beetle. Its scientific name is Barosis, probably Barosis affinis. Um, I haven't actually ID them to species yet. And these guys are herbivores, vegetarians, and they eat whatever. I'm just going to quickly go back to the source book because he's gone um, showing his underside. So these are really weird creatures. If you look there, you can see their their eyes there, the, the red bits at the front there. And I'm going to zoom out a bit. Here we go. You can see those grabbing legs. Now that's one there. And they use that to grab prey. So these guys tend to live in sort of weedier ponds, and they'll slide through the weedy ponds. You can't really see from this angle, but they're quite flattened. And they're true bugs, relatives of the water boatmen, and they will yeah, take pretty much anything they can get. And if I go in a bit closer, you can just see that stabby mouth part there, um, between the legs almost. And that, they call that the rostrum. And that's basically like a needle, and that will stab into their prey when they catch it. And it can stab into your finger if you're clumsy as well, apparently. Um, I have so far managed to avoid it. Now, a friend of mine hasn't, and it is quite painful. Oh, these are great creatures. And I'm going to scroll up, so we've got the middle pair of legs there. And you can just see the back pair of legs. And can you see it's covered in hairs? Got these fine hairs. And that acts like an oar, so they can swim quite swiftly, actually. And he's going to do it now. Are you going to do it on cue? Oh, he's... I'm going to zoom out a bit and see what we can see of him. So if I zoom right out, so he's right on the edge of the tank, of course, but you get an idea of the shape from there. And you can see there's an air bubble. And then let's see what's all shiny. Uh, that is the basically their air supply, because these creatures breathe air. But at this time of year, you might think they'll die if the pond freezes over. Um, but of course they won't, because they've got a much lower metabolism. Normally these things will be scampering off to try and hide somewhere. 
Let's zoom in on the beetle again. It's exactly the same as the source bag. They've got a bubble there, but it's on their underside. I don't know if we can get any. No, of course, he's back onto us entirely. Um, both of these have a bubble there. And because it's colder, their metabolism slows right down, so they need less oxygen. But also that bubble acts like a gill. So the oxygen can flow in and the carbon dioxide can flow out. And there'll be and colder water obviously holds more oxygen too. So they'll be alright for a while under the ice. Um, they just basically have to stay as inactive as possible to conserve oxygen. And they'll be fine until the ice clears. So yeah, there's a little tip for you. You don't generally need to smash the ice in the pond as long as it's healthy and it hasn't got fish in it. Um, but yeah, you can see the hairs on this guy's legs are used for swimming as well. They're not the strongest swimmers, um, not like the diving beetles which use those uh, really powerful legs. These just swim with all six legs and sort of do a bit like a doggy paddle, beetle style. <laughs> um, I'm just going to do something on the computer, I hope this is all coming through okay. Just moving a few windows around so I can see what's going on. Right. Um, now I think we're going to go on to the next creature, and we'll leave those as they are for now. And I've got a couple in pots, I'm going to show you them in the pot, hopefully. Now this one's quite an interesting one, so I'll get it under the light. And we're not going to get very close to this because it's actually in the pot. But if you look, you can see lots of bits of web, and I'm just going to move around a bit. Ooh. It's me, that's quite handy. And you can see a wolf spider of sorts. Yeah, so, so you can see it magnifies when it magnifies in there. And this is a pirate otter spider, Pirata piraticus. You see it's got a little bit of a web going on there. And usually for wolf spiders, they do tend to build a little base. And this is probably its overwintering spot. This is only a juvenile. And these sp wolf spiders are a bit different because they live near water, like a miniature raft spider for those that are familiar with those. Um, and yeah, this one's overwinter on a leaf, so I've just left it in the pot for now and then in the spring I'll let it go again. Um, thanks to all the restrictions changing swiftly in Essex, I got a bit caught out with some of these creatures. But I thought I'd take a fine job of it and show you guys. So that, that's a really cool little wolf spider, it'll hunt creatures on the surface and stuff like that. A bit like a pond skate owned spider form. Um, and talking of pond skaters, here is a relative of sorts of all those water boatmen and um, pond skaters that lives on the surface. Now, this is called. Oh, on the camera. Oh, the camera set on the wrong setting, sorry about that. Here we go. This is a shore bug. And those that follow me on social media might have seen a couple of pictures of this guy. Um, so this is probably more closely related to the shield bugs and those sorts of things than the other aquatic bugs. And they are very much semi-aquatic. So some of these will live almost entirely on land. But most you tend to find them sort of around your, your sedges and stuff on the edge of the pond and, run, and running around on the mud on the edge. Hence shield bug. That's why it's a bit wobbly because I'm going to hold the camera. I'm probably shivering a little bit because it's cold. <laughs> but um, again, these guys suck in mouth parts. Any insect that comes into their range uh, becomes liquefied dinner for them. Right. Um, I'm just thinking where to put the next one. They're flying through these guys. Um, I think I will chance putting it in with the others because I don't think it's. They're so cold and so inactive, I don't think they're going to do anything to each other. He says with confidence. Should be safe. Right, I'll lift the light off. Oh, let's see what this guy does. Now, this is one that anyone that's spent any time around ponds should be at least aware of. This is a great water boatman or back swimmer. So you're swimming away there. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. I like when they behave like that. Um, you can see it's quite shiny on the back there, and that's probably part of its air bubble going on. So this is the way you don't normally see these guys. They're normally upside down, hanging out at the surface, which I probably, or may do. Again, just not really, doesn't need to go to the surface as much because it's so cold. 
Um, but you can love see actually look, I'm gonna zoom right in on this leg. There you go, look at the hairs on those legs. That is one of nature's best oars for swimming in water. Absolutely perfect. Uh, you've got those fantastic bright red eyes that can see above and below them, so they can attack prey above and below. Um, and here we have, uh, under the hard wings, which is part of the forewing, we have a perfectly working set of wings. And they are quite strong flyers, um, make a lovely buzzing sound. And they have in their eyes, they have a polarising filter, which lets them see sort of the reflections you get off of water, which works really well until man come along and started making cars that were nice and shiny and the poor things um, fly along and smash headfirst into a car bonnet i've, I've seen them on a car bonnet when i parked in a wetland reserve i think it was stog marsh in kent and uh yeah must give them a bit of a headache i should think um oh max got, i'll answer your question in a second max so um let's leave this on i'm just gonna wedge you something so you can have a closer look let's zoom out a bit these guys are really cool. I do like them. Again, you don't want to get bitten by one or stabbed. I suppose is a better way of putting it. Uh, Max has asked, do water spiders struggle if they get frozen over or do they gather enough air first? So, yes, yeah, just like the water beetles, water boatmen, um, they have a supply of air on their abdomen, but they also, in addition, have that, um, that big bubble of air in their web. And in winter, they tend to do one of two things. They will either go into that web and basically seal themselves in but some will go into a snail shell and put a supply of air in there as well. Um, and that will mean um, they can overwinter at the bottom of the pond. Um, and then again, when, when it warms up in spring, they'll become more active and then they'll go up and replenish their air supply. But again, because they're so inactive, the water is so cold and oxygen rich that even the pond freezes over, they'll be absolutely fine. Unless there's some sort of event in the pond that causes anoxia. So if it gets polluted or there's like excess dead animals or plants in there. Um, but some of the pond animals have got adaptations as well that as well. Right. Um, I'm going to see. Just going to see if I can get this water boatman to turn around. If not, we'll leave him be. Come on, mate. Let's just, let's move a little bit for me. Oh, I'm just going to lift a bit too much. I don't know. He's swimming. Let's see if we can get a hang from the surface because that's their typical way of hanging. He's swimming around it. You can see they're usually a little bit more active than this. You can see it's quite lethargic the way he's moving. He was active in, in his little tank earlier. I don't think these guys are quite as inactive as others. And if you get a warm day next month, I've seen these guys taking off en masse. Oh, look at this. That's perfectly surface. Now, this is your classic back swim of you. Now, if you look closely... You can see its abdomen is sticking out the top of the water there, and I'm going to try and go for a top view here. I'm going to try and go for the glass, which is not going to be quite as clear, so I'll do that, but it will show you what I mean. You can just see there, oh, I'm out of focus again. If you look closely, you can see the water's bending round, and those hairs are hydrophobic, so they push the water away and allow the tip of the abdomen out of the water. And under the wings there, there will be, and along the bottom of the surface some degree, there's a bubble there, and that's his air supply again. So all these insects, most of them as adults, are air breathing, because obviously they've got to fly between the ponds. Um, but they are quite, you know, adapted to staying underwater, even though they breathe air, which is rather cool. Right. There we look at them. You would not want to be a tadpole with that around. Those grabbing front legs, and that stabbing rostrum again. Right, let's see what else we've got to show you. Oh, he's swimming off again. Um, right, I'm going to introduce you to the little cousins. This is almost certainly going to swim straight, disappear straight away, so just bear with me a second. Oh, oh, oh. oh look at that. I very rarely do that, so that was lucky. It is. Now this, well the last one we saw is the back was the back swimmer or the great water boatman. This is the lesser water boatman. I'm pretty sure this is one of the cigaria species, which is one of the medium-sized ones. So this is about 
or what is it, seven millimeters long, something like that. And I'll get in a bit closer so we can have a closer look in. So they have that same red eye. They can fly quite well, the wings fly on there, but you can really see that shiny underside. So that's their air bubble. At the front here, you can see their front legs. They're not grabbing front legs. They've actually got loads of hairs on, so a bit like a shovel, so they can shovel algae towards their mouth. And um, and their rostrum, in most species, there we go, oh, look, he's, he's even cleaning it for us. That was good. Just demonstrated how he shoveled things towards his mouth for us. Lovely there. Um, and it acts more like a straw, so they're just sort of sucking up particles of food. Um, they too have those powerful swimming legs. There's the grabbing legs there. The swimming legs are at the back. Can we see them? Oh, there you go. He's holding them forward for us. So that's the back legs, but they're the furthest forward because they hold them facing forwards. So, oh, look at that. Thank you for the demonstration of how you swim. Marvellous. But they're really cool things. But weirdly, they're not as closely related to the great water boatmen um, as you think they're actually sort of on the other, other side of that group, despite them both being water boatmen. Right. Um, I think... How are we doing for time? It's only 25. So we've flown through these creatures. I thought I wouldn't have time to show you them all, but it uh, turns out we've had loads of time. Um, I think I'm going to just pour these straight into this tank. I'm getting them out again afterwards, I know. And this one is a bit of a surprise, not the sort of thing you might expect to find in a pond in winter. Those of you that have been following me on social media will probably know what this is. But I was, you know, it's not unheard of them to be in a pond, but I wouldn't expect to see one at the stage this one's at. Um, let me just scoop these out earlier. From my pond. Actually, most of these are from my pond anyway. Um, so I'm swatching tanks, so I've got to move everything around. There we go. Yep, that is what you think it is. That is two tadpoles, frog tadpoles. Now, if you look closely, They've both got legs. Well, actually, I'm not sure I've got one. The top one. Look at that pair of legs. And there's probably a few more in my pond as well. And that one's sort of mid-metamorphosis, which is kind of cool. But they're they're actually getting reasonably big. Um, they're sort of maximum size now, so they might actually, or normal maximum size, they might even get even bigger. And of course, this sort of thing is. Reasonably commonplace further north, sort of in Scotland and places like that, because it's so cold they don't manage to develop. But um, lack of warmth has not been a problem this year, so I suspect it was the fact that I had 11 to 13 clumps of frog spawn, which works out somewhere between 11 and 13,000 tadpoles hatching, and basically no predators in my pond. So apart from blackbirds visiting, uh, so odds are it was just sheer competition, because what tadpoles will do. Is what, as they start to develop, if they're developing quicker, they release a hormone to stunt their brothers and sisters. Uh, so it spreads out the emergence of them to some degree. So which makes sense if you think about it. You've got to get some out every year, and uh, that's one way of ensuring that some get out early. And if there's a drought on land, um, and some die, well then at least there's another load in the pond. And vice versa, if the pond dries out, at least some got out before it did. It dried out. So uh, yeah. Interesting creatures. I'm just going to uh, move this around so you can have a closer look. There we go. Tepholes. I didn't expect you photographing tadpoles at this time of year, put it that way. We've got a couple of questions, let's see here. Um, oh, uh, MT photo video saying that they found back swimmers, um, dozens of back swimmers, uh, try to land on their car, usually in summer. And usually they perish because heat. Would it be attracted to the colour? I imagine so, because it's shiny and blue, which I imagine a lot of water is, isn't it? Um, Laura Reed said sexy legs. They most certainly are sexy legs. <laughs> you can find frog legs sexy, I suppose. Um, yeah, well, going back to the car question, yeah, that, that does make sense. I imagine um, the reason they're, they're flying around a lot in summer is A, it's warm enough for them to fly, and B, they're probably coming from ponds. Um, that have have dried or are drying out that is, it once a pond gets warm and shallow that triggers them to fly it seems uh, if you do pond dipping in, on a hot day in summer you'll quite often find um 
that your back swimmers and water boatmen like to fly out and sometimes your diving beetles as well. Right. Let's have another let's see if we can get a better look at this guy now the other one's gone. There you go, you can see he's almost frog shaped partly. The head's gone that less tab holey and uh, more froggy. Just get, well, we might go back to the saucer bug and then see if I can get him to. Is it in, oh, the camera moved, didn't it? Right. If I see what. I'm just going to give the saucer bug a little bit of a gentle nudge and see if I can get him to sit in the leaf for us. So we can just. I want to show the shape of his head. What we're planning on doing, we're going to do obviously a few of these sorts of things. Um, I will at some point do a talk on pond creatures using my photos. All oh, right, that's sort of like a circle, which is absolutely perfect. One, right, we're whizzing over to the saucer bug. Sorry for the uh, quick change there. Here we go. You can see what the shape of the saucer bug now. You see, it's very flattened. Its eye is actually almost saucer shaped, so that eye goes over the top and the bottom of the head and actually sort of curves round and goes back on over itself which is a really weird thing. Let's see if I can get into the coat and show you what I mean. Here we go. You know you can really see that rostrum and grabbing feet there. They are remarkable animals. And you can see the silver underside again. That air bubble. But yeah you would not want to be a small pond creature and meet that that guy. I can tell you that much. Now somewhere here we have I'm just gonna I, think I might take this chap out and if he wants to come Right, sorry for the silence there, I was just concentrating on something. Now this next one has a habit of playing dead and making me panic. But he is quite healthy, he's, I've seen him eating. He seems quite fine, so don't panic if he looks, looks a little bit lifeless when I put him in. This is... He's going to lay on his back just to make it look like... I don't know if you can see that. Oh, there we go. Oh, he's woken up. He's going to run off if I'm not careful, so let me quick. Here we go. This is a diving beetle larva. And we'll zoom in on that head as well. Oh, he's going to run off, so let me quick. So these guys have a massive pair of jaws. Um, the picture I used to advertise this talk, it's one of those. So this is a much smaller one. Possibly, I'm not convinced it's a great diving beetle larva. It's one of the smaller species. He's running up to the surface there. So this guy tends to hang from the surface. He, a bit like the um, water boatman, that he's got some hairs to push water away when it comes to the surface and breed. And they're just amazing little creatures. And he's going to run down the back of the leaf so we can't see him anymore. I can guarantee that. This illustrates that, uh, not to pick up my own photography, but it's not, it's not as simple as putting something down and it poses for you. Because they like to do stuff like this. Bye! We have the little, all the little brooses are swimming around. I can see my fellow Shun how he swims. And he's, this is the other thing they do. They like to hide behind whatever bit of weed you've put in there or the edge of the tank. Here we go. Right, he's sat quite nicely now, actually. It's, uh, There you go. Oh, look at that. What a beautiful animal. Such underrated things, pond creatures. You can really see him. He's using those antennae just to see if there's any food around, I think. Just find his way. Oh! They're quite reluctant swimmers, these guys. Especially when they're trying to be inactive in winter.
Nope, there you go. And you can see how you swim with all six legs there. Need to remind me or not. Right, I'm gonna switch back to me there. Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on the questions. Anyone got any questions they want to ask? Um, there's going to be a little bit of delay between me asking that question and you typing anything. Um, I keep getting the occasional warning. Has the video quality and fit and sound been okay? Um, I hope it has. This one seems to have gone better than our previous videos so far. We thought we'd keep it simple today. I see Vic's answered Matt's question there. Oh, I got a great silver diving beetle. Oh, technically, great silver water beetle because it's not a diving beetle. If I'm being really um, picky and overly scientific, because a diving beetle is a different group. The uh, great silver water beetle is related to that Brosus. Uh, uh, they're actually the scavenger water beetles as a group that they belong to, and it's the biggest beetle in Britain, which is cool. But yeah, it's a good find, great silver diving beetle. Whereabouts in the country are you? Because um, we, we have quite a lot here in the Thames Estuary. There's a few other patches that have them up in uh, East Anglia, especially, and I don't know really where else, like South Wales and Dungeness, I think I've got them. Yeah. And Vic's asking the questions on frogs and toads because she's the expert on them. Well, they aren't pretty good, but <laughs> she's the one obsessed with them. Cooksy, fascinating little creatures, they most certainly are, keeping me interested. Um, and literally, I haven't got an especially good pond. Some of these aren't actually from my pond. They, they didn't make it back because of lockdown restrictions, sadly. Um, but they'll be perfectly fine. I'll be keeping an eye on them. I've got loads of bloodworm in my pond, so anything predatory's got plenty to eat, and I've got a load of weeds. So don't worry about them. I'll be keeping an eye on them. And if the forecast says minus five, they'll be going in my conservatory to stop, <laughs> stop everything from freezing because if they're in smaller containers, they might be in trouble if it freezes. Um, and interestingly about the water spider, I did have, have a confession um, when we had was it the beast from the east or one of the other really cold spells. I had a water spider in this in aquarium in this shed, and I came in um, because it had been sort of minus three, minus four, um, and they'd been fine, and I didn't expect them not to be. And I think it dropped to minus nine. It wasn't forecast to be. It dropped to minus nine overnight. I woke up in the morning, came straight down to try and get them out. And the tank looked like it was frozen solid. I don't think it was. I think it just froze along the edges. Um, and the water spider was fine inside. When it, when, it, when it thawed out, I was expecting to throw away a dead spider. And there it was. In spring, came out perfectly fine. In fact, it was, I think it was a little bit active. It warmed up suddenly. Oh, it was March, wasn't it? Beast from the East. That's probably why. But yeah. Brilliant. Um, don't know if any other questions come up. Oh, thanks, Annie. Yep. Thanks for the feedback there, that's great. Right, well, I think we're up to about half hour ish, must be by now. Um, if not, to, I've, I've missed where the time is on my. What's it saying here? It's saying, yeah, we're about half hour. Well, I think rather than just drag it out and just whitter on, unless anyone's got any questions, I think fix. Answered everyone's questions. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, em empty photo video. I'm just being really picky. Um, I, in some books, it's actually called um, Great Silver Diving Beetle, I've noticed. So, um, <laughs> it's just me being a um, pond nerd picking that one out. Um, yeah, on the levels. Oh, is that um, Somerset Levels? I take it. You're near Vic, are you? Um, are you someone I know? And it's just a name I don't know. <laughs> Thinking. Um, MT, do I know an MT? Hmm, what do I think? And yeah, some said I need to get now. You've got some cool um, of the great diving beetles, Ditiscus down there that I've not seen. Is it the King Great Diving Beetle or something like that? It's the biggest ones down there. You've got lesser silver water beetle there as well, which I really want to see because we don't get that down here. Um, oh, Anna Kirksmith says, Delightful evening, oh, thank you very much very small pond made this year so what if anything should I be doing as spring comes around to begin the year's management of it well if it's a wildlife pond um, I'd try and get a few of the dead leaves out now if you've got if it's got lots of dead leaves in if it's anything like my pond my pond has about that much water and the rest is pretty much dead leaves at the moment um, I'm loath to take too many out because of the tadpoles and stuff 
and I found some encrusting stuff, um, some little single-celled filter feeding things um, on some leaves. So I'm a little bit, but I don't want. That's a long, long way of answering. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of what you could do, um, you could get some pom plants, make sure they're native, make sure you get from a reputable supplier that doesn't have a zola and stuff in their tanks. I know some supposedly up-end um, tropical fish shops that sell tons and stuff that had things like Azola and non-natives that would you know, contaminate in their native plants, which would be bad news for your pond. Um, yeah, and just enjoy it in spring. <laughs> Especially if you're going to get, you might, you know, you might get some frogs and newts turn up because they do, they can smell the water of new ponds, especially frogs. Um, so you never know. Oh, Linda, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's always good to see pond life. Well, I am biased, obviously. <laughs> I think so. How can I raise power it needs to F? Um, now, here we go. Uh, by F, do you mean the when they've metamorphosed and lost their gills? In which case, it's quite hard, and you've got to get lots of small prey. If it's um, you mean the tadpoles, newt poles, oh, it's, it's a minefield that you can start an argument at a herpetological conference with that question. Um, raising them, just get loads of water fleas. They're hoover up water fleas. Um, they're purely predatory, so they're not like frog tadpoles, which are nice and easy to feed. Um, you have to give them live prey. Um, I'd minimise how many you keep in a tank because they will eat each other <laughs> as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and he asked, is it necessary to feed tadpoles? Um, well, it's on a new pond, maybe I chucked, ch chucked, chucked a couple of. Um, catfish tadpoles in because they ate all, what looked like they'd eaten all the algae you're, what you'll find is you'll get a bit of an algae bloom in spring especially in a new pond and the tadpoles hoover it up it's lovely just let them get on with it um and to be honest uh, to some degree you don't artificially feeding them could uh, is putting nutrients into the system which can cause problems with algae and oxygen um depletion and the tadpoles are kind of self-controlling um if they start running out of protein they'll just start eating each other, which is, you know, that's why they have thousands of tadpoles. Um, and, yeah, I just left my... I, I did cover a few um, algae wafers in because they're, because they're designed for a fish tank, they're low-polluting, but the best thing to do um, is just let them get on with it. Especially if you've got plants in there, they'll be fine. Um, things will eat them as well. Um, and it's all the wonderful nature, etc. Um, just the, be the best thing to do is make sure they've got somewhere to go when they come out, so you've got some long grass, um, some leaf litter and logs and stuff like that right next to the pond and hopefully linking to sort of like a hedgerow or something or some bushes and then they can disperse safely that that's probably when they're sort of more vulnerable because obviously the numbers are massively reduced by the time they've got to froglets from tadpoles yeah that's a bit quick saying yeah you can feed them tadpole food but yeah it's kind of like ask free ask different people get different answers kind of question i think Max Thompson photo. Well, I'm not following you now. Now I'll go and have check you out, Max. Um, Max has explained who he is. Uh, MT photo video. So that's MT photo video, not Max Cantor. <laughs> it's getting confusing. Um, ah, the foot spa tapos. I haven't tried that yet. Oh, have you have you tried that, Max? Have you actually um, put your feet in the pond? I've done it with shrimps and prawns and a rock pool accidentally. I was just sort of standing there trying to catch something and. Feels like tickling your feet. Yeah, Nick. Um, thing is, Water Vault. Uh, Nick's just said it'd be great to try a stream. There's a stream just up the road um, next door to where Nick is, um, and just up the road from me, which I'm still I'm in iron with. I can actually go and see under the current rules. Um, I may just crack and go and look at some point. Um, it, it, but it was a sewage outlet basically um we do we do get some damp nice damsels down there but they tend to be sort of most of them and they're a pondy type creatures which tend to be more tolerant so i don't think there's going to be a massive amount of interesting stuff in there but who knows because water voles can live in polluted water weirdly as long as, long as the food they feed on isn't it's yeah they're not that fussy um as long as there's no mink seems to be the problem yeah yeah, right. Um, 
I just turned into a nice little talk at the end there, probably. <laughs> More interesting than the creatures in some ways. Um, any other questions? Or oh, any nice things you want to talk about? Oh, Max. Max says he... Uh, Max Cantrell said he uh, he did it, which I'm guessing he's talking about the tap holes. Um, uh, sparring his feet. Marvellous. Uh, I don't know. My pond's not that... <laughs> My son's jumped in it this year, so... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's had a foot, a foot spa from Tepos uh, inadvertently. Um, yeah. Right then. Not seeing any more questions coming up. We've been going for nearly 40 minutes. That's quite nice. That's sort of what we're aiming for. Um, I guess I better do the plugging stuff. Uh, a bit cold in the feet, Max. I'll just uh, plug a few bits. We have got Jack Perks. For those... Oh, let's start for all. If you don't listen to the podcast, you can watch our podcast and you've enjoyed this. Um, it's even better, the podcast, because Victoria's on it most of the time as well. <laughs> she, she, she's much nicer than me. Um, we talk about all sorts of things. Um, we've had, well, The last one we had was on snowdrops and winter aconites. We've talked about newts. We've done an episode on frogs. We've done an episode on moles. We've done an episode on dragonflies. We've interviewed Nick Baker, Yolo Williams, uh, Dr. George McGavin, Stephen Moss. Um, we've just interviewed um, Ashley Whiffin, that should be going out sooner rather than later um, all sorts of brilliant people um, if you're going to do the uh, Garden Bird Watch, do listen to the one we did on the Garden Bird Watch like this time last year um, with oh my word, his name's gone out of my head a lovely man from the RSVB Vic, help me out <laughs> I can't be quite his name, is. it'll come to me in a minute um, Yes. Ah, best, uh, Anna's just asked I'm going to interrupt my plugging because Anna Kirksmith has asked, what are the best books on Pond Life to get? Um, well, at, right at this moment, um, Collins, Paul, Fresh, Collins Freshwater Life is a good book. That's in print. Um, it's okay. It's a good start, but it's trying to do a bit too much. And the pictures are pretty good, but some of them, are, to me, don't look like the creature. But to other people, they will. Um, uh, for That's for just general ID. For a bit more in-depth, um, small... Freshwater Creatures, I think it's called. If you scroll back through my Instagram, um, you can see... Perhaps I should do a thing showing some good books on here. That would be a good, po a good video podcast. Um, you'll see it on there. I think it's Oxford Press. It's out of print. And sometimes it goes for stupid money. But sometimes you can find one for sort of 10, 15 quid. Um, that's really good. Pictures are a bit meh in some cases. But they've got, rather than just size and where you find it, they've got a good paragraph or two on this, each species and a whole a page on each group. So... That's really quite nice to get some information. Um, yeah, but if you hang on, I think it, oh, I don't know when it's out now, but Nick Baker is writing a wild guide on pond creatures, which will be illustrated by certain somebody's pictures. So that's hopefully going to be a good, well, it will be a good book. Nick's writing it, for goodness sake. He knows what he's on about. Um, and he's researching his off. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he should be good. I've sent him some stuff to research as well. So it should be a good, good book. But um, might have to wait a while for that. Um, when you get more in depth, there's all sorts of guides for each group. So uh, for my Christmas, from my lovely little sister, I got um, the key to British bryozoans, which are tiny little field feeding creatures that are really hard to explain. Uh, there's a book on, there's a whole f four volumes on water beetles, um, and there's atlases to show where all these things live. Um, yeah, and obviously there's books on fish. There's a brilliant um, book on fish, which isn't really pondy, I suppose, but that's it's a Secret Lies of Freshwater Fish. Nick Baker's always plugging it. It's Jack Perks illustrated it, and I forget the author's name, but it's a really good book. Yeah, The Pond by Carl Ewart. Hmm, I have to check that one out. There's loads of old pond books, but no one's done one for two decades. Um, I did start writing one, and then I found out Nick's writing one, so he's doing one. I am, oh, shall I reveal it now? I am actually writing a different pond book, which is more the sort of story of me finding things and um because i've been well, all around the southeast uh looking for various pond creatures like looking for medicinal leeches um if this is a leech podcast episode you can hear some of that um and i'm just sort of doing a chapter on each thing so there'll be one oh my i think the light on my um thing is gone it's all right i've got a backup light there we go hey <laughs> see i was actually prepared for once um, i look a bit spooky now but never mind some people say i look spooky anyway um yeah but no, there's loads of pond books. If you type in pond book, and there's also, um, if people are interested, uh, get in contact with me. 
you can get a free book that's 100 years old that has got some amazing stuff in on Pond Life. So um, we go on the archive. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I've sent it to Nick and he was like, oh, this is interesting. Brilliant old school pictures in there, like Great Silver Water Beetle Lava and stuff. Um, oh, Jules Howard's Pond book. Of course. Thanks, Annie. Oh, how did I forget that? That's brilliant. I should remember it. It's got two of my pictures in it. <laughs> but um, that's an, if you want to build a wildlife pond book, get that book. That is brilliant. I've got I bought it even though I've already built a pond book. Uh, it built a pond because it's such a well written book. Jules researched that really well. Um, that's a fantastic book. And money goes to wildlife trust when you buy it as well, I believe. So uh, that's a, a good choice. Um, yes, I should probably get back to the plug. Oh, blimey, that's a bit bright, isn't it? Um, so I look a bit washed out now, but uh, it's that or pitch black. Um, there we go, problem solved. Um, there's all stuff in the way. Um, it's great being a photographer, you've got diffusion material just lying around. Um, yeah, so podcast, check it out, UK Wildlife Podcast, uh, Twitter, we're UK Wildlife Pod, um, UK Wildlife Podcast on Instagram, all one word. And you've got Wildlife Podcast on Facebook. We've got a page as well. Go follow. There's a group as well if you want to join in. Um, we've got the UK Wildlife Podcast community group. Um, and also go and join the um, Nick Baker's Insta Live group because that's what well, I think a few of you are on that already. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think that's it. All to plug, really. We should be back on sun, uh, Saturday for another video. We haven't actually decided what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, barely anyone tuned in last time so we may change the times I'm not going to say 11 o'clock is definite time but that was that's the plan time but yeah well I think I'm going to stop now because I'm just wittering on even worse than usual now uh, so I hope you've enjoyed the show um, if you think of a question afterwards just drop me a message I'm more than happy to answer um, but yeah any questions for Jack Perks for our next podcast as well so anything on freshwater fish filming freshwater fish or just some really awkward questions for him because he's a mate of mine. It's always fun to uh, <laughs> to wind up your mates on the podcast. So, um, yeah, as long as it's not where babies come from. <laughs>